I think it's time to start. It's great to see so many already here. And uh, I think a few more will probably be joining while we talk. Uh, so let me welcome you to this edition of Product Tank Hamburg uh, with our friend Petra Wille, who we will introduce to you later. First of all, let me tell you a few introductory things, especially for those of you who haven't been part of a Product Tank meetup before. So first of all, for Product Tank Hamburg, let me briefly introduce who we are organizing this for you. We have Anja, we have Alex, we have Tobias, and myself, Arne. And uh, we are organizing this meetup roughly once a quarter. And uh, if you want to join our community, please sign up to the group that we have on Zing so that you can stay up to date with our upcoming uh, meetings. But if this is uh, the first time you are joining for Product Tank, you might wonder, OK, what is Product Tank all about? And I'm happy to tell you. So Product Tank is a meetup that was founded in 2010 in London. And uh, meanwhile, is available in over 200 cities across the world, really on all continents. Well, I'm not sure about Antarctica, but all other continents for sure. And the overall community of members for Product Tank is over 200,000 people. So this is the biggest product manager community uh, in the world, and we are happy to be a part of this community. Uh, and feel free to check out the pro mindtheproduct.com slash product tank website uh, to see where all these meetups are happening right now. As you can tell, since we are all digital, why not join a product tank in Nairobi or in Australia or somewhere? It's possible, and it might be an interesting new perspective for you. But of course, in general, the focus of uh, product tanks is on the local scene and on the fact that it's organized by product managers for product managers. So since the product tanks are usually small meetups in the evenings and you might want more, I can also tell you uh, that Mind the Product, the organization behind Product Tank, is also running five annual conferences. Usually they happen uh, in place. Right now, most of the conferences happen digital. And you can see the dates here. You can also find them on the Mind the Product website. I also want to mention that we have a local conference in Hamburg called MTP Engage, which unfortunately we cannot do this year, but we already have a date for next year. It will happen on June 17th of 2022. And uh, so uh, here, extra marker. Oops, so extra marker uh, for you. And I also want to mention for the product leaders among you, we have a leadership event this year happening on the seven, uh, 27th of September of this year. So if you're interested, please feel free to reach out and we can tell you more about it. Um, if among all those events, you want to stay up to date with the freshest product content, then Mind the Product uh, also has a blog uh, with great posts from many, many contributors. And uh, since last year, also a membership area where you can get exclusive contents. Uh, there are two memberships. One is the so-called prioritized memberships for all people working in product. And then there is a dedicated membership for product leaders. And I can tell you it's a really good thing. Just last night, I participated in an Ask Me Anything with Donna Alicia from New York. And we were speaking uh, about owning your own story as a product leader in quite an intimate group. And it was really, really an interesting exchange that we had there. So if this is your cup of tea, then uh, check it out on the Mind the Product website. Um, last but not least, Mind the Product is the, and the whole community behind it is always looking for people to support it because it's only so good as the people that are involved. And there are many ways how you can get involved. First of all, you can speak at your local product tank, or you can also reach out to product tanks elsewhere in the world and propose interesting talks to talk about. You can write for the Mind the Product blog, and you can also host local meetups, for instance, by offering your office building as an environment uh, to run the meetup, you know, uh, provide some beers or some other drinks for people to enjoy so that they have a nice evening. This is also a great way for your company to get exposure in the product community, not by advertising, but really by supporting the community and showing that you really mean it. And with that, um, yeah, I would like uh, to thank you for being here and we'll now hand over uh, to Tobias for the actual content of tonight. Thanks very much, Arne. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you our special guest tonight, our local hero, the one and only Petra Wille. 
Petra is a product leadership coach and co-organizer of MTP Engage Hamburg. Furthermore, she's the author of Strong Product People, a well-received masterpiece on how to fulfill the demanding role as head of product and developing strong product managers. Her book reflects her rock-solid experience of 20 plus years in the digital industry. Petra started off as a developer and conceptual designer at Border Digital Systems. Later, she was a consultant at SAP and hands-on product manager at Xing, the best professional social network of all times, before she became director of product and later managing director at Tolingo. October 2013, Petra decided to jump in coaching full-time, leaving the safety net of employment behind her to widen her to widen her to a broader audience of clients. Very quickly, she became a well-known product management expert and a thought leader in the German community as well as beyond. We, the Product Tank Hamburg crew, are more than pleased to welcome a real Hamburg product management celebrity. Moin Moin, Petra, how are you? <laughs> moin Moin, it was such a fun introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Toby. <laughs> what, what was the fun about? <laughs> The local hero part and all these kind of things. I feel honored. Hello, Hamburg tribe. Um, nice to be on the stage again. It has been some years. <laughs> yeah, and we are very lucky to to have you today, Petra. And the reason uh, to have you here is not only because you are definitely the thought leader of the German product community, um, it's also because you recently published a book. And uh, congratulations, first of all. Uh, your book was successfully released in January. Petra, exactly how does it two feel? Two months ago to the day. <laughs> yeah, how, it, how does it feel? <laughs> it actually feels good, like, but like with every product uh, launch, right? The, the week when I actually launched it, I was a bit of super stressful to actually get it out and I could not actually celebrate. Um, but now, eight weeks in or nine weeks in, um, and with so many people actually writing that the book is helpful and has helped them in some context in a one-on-one -on -one they had um in yeah tricky situations where they ha had to have a tricky conversation with their employees so that helps um and i'm pretty happy and it was really nice to see how supportive the product community is right so everybody was sharing it and talking about it and so that was pretty cool yeah yeah i can say as one of the product community we really like it and i had the pleasure uh, to read it even before it got published. So thanks for giving me that opportunity. Last and summer, yeah. Yeah, last, last, late, late summer. And when I read it, I quickly realized it's really a truly valuable reference for product leaders. And I wish I'd read it years ago. So hence, allow me that question. Why did it take so long? What did you have <laughs> to learn to write this book? Yeah, actually, I had to... So it... it so what I had to learn first is to work with many, many product managers and see where they struggle and um, how to help them best. And then the last two years, I mainly work with product leads, helping their product people um, to get better in what they actually do. And so that was a bit of an, um, yeah, cr coaching people through other people that I'm coaching. Um, kind of thing. And while I was doing this, I really needed to reflect on the tools, the framework and the thing, things that I was using back when I was coaching PMs and how I can explain them to product leads so that they can use it in their day to day lives. And that helped me to get at this level where I thought like, okay, now it's maybe worth to put everything in a book. And um, frankly, it was just about time because I'm doing this freelance thing for quite a while. And at some point in time, you have to write a book, right? Um, and people development really is a topic that I am passionate about. So, yeah, it, it was just about time to write the book. <laughs> yeah, that's um, um, that's a good aspect. You, you're talking about time to write a book. Now, I can imagine it's pretty tough to write a book. And you did not only, uh, quote unquote, um, write a book, um, but you also had to run your business in parallel. And then there was this pandemic as well um, hitting your roadmap kind of last year. Uh, how did that feel? How how did that impact your writing process? Was it just a year without sleep or how did you deal with that? <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, yeah, it, it massively impacted the planning. So I was originally planning with um, three days a week of writing and digesting and thinking about what is my take on that and what is my take on, on this other thing. Um, 
but then the pandemic hit and then there was a kid at home um, we needed to take care about right so and my husband and I really took shifts and turns um, to make it work and the book was written at many many evenings and a lot of Saturdays have been sacrificed to this book at writing this book um, but I still wanted to keep with the plan because I had an editor I had agreed um, with him on that is kind of the plan then we want to be finished he was working on all my not so English sentences sometimes and making them nicer and corrected them a lot um, so we wanted to stick to the plan um, and that's what we did and actually in the end um, it worked out pretty well um, with the help of a lot of product folks uh, for the feedback during summer and it took me a bit longer than I would have expected um, to get it out because I not only did the writing I did the self-publishing part as well which is a totally different game wow yeah, um, yeah and that took me another half a year right so the book was more or less finished in October last year and then it took until January to get it out yeah Thanks even more for for running through that pain and providing us with uh, with your <laughs> insights uh, between um, between two covers of a book. Um, you, you, talking about pain, um, it, it as a product manager, it always triggers uh, the value proposition canvas in my mind. Uh, what would you say is your book more of a pain reliever or a gain creator? Ooh. Maybe it's more of a pain reliever and uh, it's hard to say. So the thing is what I really hope how the people are using this book is not to read it front to back that I think is not that valuable. I think it's, or you can do it like that, but I think it's more like, um, yeah, if you go want to travel to Italy or to Rome, right? So you then you're booking, um, you're buying the book and you read a lot about ah oh, the nice things you could be doing in Italy and what you can, where you could go. But then when you once you're there, you read the respective chapters, and I think that's where my book is maybe a bit of a pain, yeah, a pain relief. Um, if you are in the situation where you think like, okay, this product manager really needs help with time management. Is there anything in Petra's book? How can I just not telling them that their time management is off uh, and leaving them with that? How can I help them to actually progress in their time management capabilities? Um, then you can at least go to the respective chapter. And that is maybe more of a pain reliever. Um, but over time, it's talking a lot about coaching and why this is important. If you're a product leader, um, that is more to the gain side of things, I'd say. So maybe it's both. Hopefully it's both. Yeah, I, lo I love the idea of or th this image of uh, being a, the, the seeing the book as a travel guide because um, <laughs> it's really a bit like a travel guide for for product leaders and hopefully as well for product managers. We, we're going to discuss that uh, a bit later as well. Um, in in part one, uh, you ask the product people managers to first define their good. Um, they should ask themselves and reflect on what makes a good product manager for them. Um, your own profile, uh, you list a few aspects there and you say um, a good product manager from your point of view contains for existence um, intellectual horsepower and emotional intelligence. Um, now, just to um, mention two examples. <laughs> Just, just to just mention, to mention two. Two sure, yeah. sure. There's more on the list, but let's just focus on those <laughs> two. So uh, imagine there are only two candidates on planet Earth, and you are the hiring manager. And the one of the candidates is a super smart analytical mastermind equipped with zero ability to emphasize. And the other one being a high emotional intelligence, but truly not the brightest candle on the cake. Whom would you personally give a chance and why? The one who is really up for learning, I'd say, um, of at least that's that's just like coming back. Curiosity is another thing that is on my list, right? So that is all where it would come back to. So how curious are both of these people to learn new things and to dive a bit deeper into what they already can do and what are the strong um, stakes are and where they have kind of um, fields of improvement or. Um, or chances to learn something new. And I think that is the thing that I would actually test. So is there a willingness to um, leave the thing that they are currently rely on with all they get usually, because if they're a one trick pony, so they maybe are really relying on this. And do they want to explore other things with me coaching them along, right? That is all what it's all about. Um, so many product leaders 
don't invest enough time to help the people grow. Um, and that, that, that will be the test here. Yeah. So, um, in, in the book, I think you use that term of, um, um, I, I can't remember the, the, the right term. It, it's a bit like the CPO should be, uh, properly equipped, uh, in, in the product manager's brain, they should be able to compute information quite fast. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, so that goes more to the inte intellectual horsepower, intellectual horsepower. the term you're yeah. using. Yeah. And the, yeah. Um, do, do you think education is also an aspect in there? Because most of the product managers nowadays, they they have a, a very different backgrounds. So they come from diff very different angles. That's our superpower. <laughs> that's that's a superpower. Yeah, may, maybe it is. But um, uh, we we now see also popping popping up at universities courses to to study product management. Um, yeah. Do you do you think the educational background um, is also important, or would you say that that's not that important as long as you as long as you have an, um, a learning mindset, intellectual horsepower, and some emotional intelligence? I think that the the background is important for you. Because it might be easier to break into product if you have a certain type of background. Um, so if there is a bit of business acumen or if you have an engineering background or these kind of things, then it might be easier for you to step into product if that is something you're interested in. But ultimately, I saw great product people coming from so many different backgrounds. Um, that I, I think from a company perspective or from a product leadership perspective, you should not limit yourself by looking at the formal education of people. Um, but for sure, it, it time, yeah, time to market. <laughs> so um, from the decision to break into product until you really are a competent product manager um, making decent decisions, um, that might be a shorter time uh, if you come from several backgrounds, but it's never impossible um, to break into product with whatever formal education. And the question of, is it good that there are more universities offering product management as a course? Um, I'd say this is amazing because we maybe all would benefit from somebody uh, who really has spent four years already in thinking and learning about product management before they actually get into their first job. Um, and I think that could be something every company and every team would benefit from and just adds to the diversity of the community. Mm. Um, wh while, we, while we also see that a lot of companies aim to make data-driven decisions nowadays and that maybe tells us uh, it's good to have some numerical um, uh, horsepower, let's say, to, to compute and, and crunch numbers. Um, but in your book, you also emphasize on the product manager's gut feeling. Um, what Sean Russell introduced us with yeah, the term nice. Produktgefühl. Produktgefühl. Um, <laughs> yeah, which for, for those who, who do not um, uh, live in, ha in, in, in Hamburg or in Germany, um, it, it means something like having a feeling for the right next step in product management. Um, how should we understand this? Um, aren't decisions based on a gut feeling bad decisions? That's at least what we thought in the past, I think. Um, yeah, to give a bit more context on what Sean Russell was actually talking about, Sean, um, in a talk he gave last year, was looking into why are some people really talented in learning new languages and why some people struggle? And he tried to see the same um, pattern in product management. So why is it easier for some people to break into product management and others take longer or really struggle with um, becoming a product manager at all? So, and he figured out that it's um, several things that he summarizes under this term of Produktgefühl. Um, yeah, and I'm a big I'm a big fan of gut feeling as well. I talk about it in the book. It's oh, if if you just rely on gut feeling, this is always a stupid thing to do. Um, because what gut feeling actually is, is a lot of experience you have. So if you join a new company or you start in a new team, for sure you should not trust your gut feeling because it is something that needs to be built up. Um, and I always say, or that's something Hendrik Nieberg said, actually, bring me some data, bring me some customer feedback and ask your gut feeling what it actually tells you. And I think if you have these three things at hand, that at least is a good first start if you want to validate an idea and think about is it worth pursuing or is it worth to put this on our discovery schedules or something like this. So it's not only gut feeling, 
Um, but gut feeling has been a bit neglected the last uh, the past few years, and maybe we should mm. all, um, yeah, nourish it a bit more and uh, make use of it a bit more. Yeah, I, I like that. Maybe it's the superpower you need when there is not enough or not good enough data available. And as a product manager, you still need to be able to take decisions because uh, taking no decision yeah. is not an option, right? Yeah. Um, so now, now we talked a bit uh, about the product managers themselves, and I'm pretty sure a lot of them are listening to us um, tonight. Um, and yeah, your book clearly focuses on, on the heads of product, but I believe it's also of big value for individual contributors. Um, so at this point, we would like to open up the session to everyone in the audience and start with the Ask Petra Anything. <laughs> so... To everybody listening to us, please leave your questions in the chat. We're going to pick them up and we're going to pick up as many as we can. Um, but don't worry if we do not pick up your question. We've also planned for an after show event on wonder.me. You'll get the link later in the show. Um, and there you'll get the chance to meet and talk to Petra, actually. Um, so if we do not pick up your questions, just wait a bit for the after show and show up there. Um, we will also have a quiz show there and you you can win awesome prices so it's definitely worth to stay tuned um but for now we're going to discuss with you in three topics sequentially and the first one being assessing so assessing myself as a product manager where am i today how how can i understand where i am today and the second one being becoming a strong product manager what can I do to grow and develop myself? And the third one we'd like to discuss with Petra in the Ask Petra Anything session is challenging, challenging environments as a product manager. And here the ambiguity is quite intended. So what we mean is how can I deal with challenging surroundings as well as how can I challenge these surroundings to trigger positive change? So as you can see, it's A, B, C. Uh, during our AMA. Uh, so let's start with the first block, assessing myself as a product manager. So let's give it a try and start. Um, how do I assess myself as a product manager? Feel free to raise your questions in the YouTube chat now, and please be so kind to put an hashtag A in front um, of your post so we can quickly identify the questions related to, to this block. So hashtag A followed by your question. And to give you some moment to think and type, let me ask the first question to Petra. Petra, one of the common threats in your book is the PM wheel framework. We've seen you blogging and talking about uh, this also um, a bit. And it's a tool that maybe could be used um, by PMs themselves for self-assessment. Um, could you give us a quick introduction into the PM wheel? So what is it and how should PMs use it and when should they use it? Sure, it's actually the PMs why I created it. So in um, when I first started coaching, I figured out that I but that's what a great coach does. So in the beginning, there is an assessment. And then you think about, OK, uh, what should be the topics you are discussing based on this assessment? And I was lacking such an assessment. Um, and then at one point in time, um, I thought like I collected a lot of questions that helped me going in our first coaching session. And at some point, I thought like, OK, that's already a massive collection of um, framing questions, maybe it needs to be a bit more formalized and um, to have a, yeah, a format that I can share it with the world and that other people can use it. Um, and the first people that were using it were PMs in startups when there was no head of product around, no, no peers around that actually doing the same job, because for them it is really hard to progress. Uh, from whom should they get the input of what they could learn next or what they could try next? So. That's actually the first people that were using it. And since then, since 2016, I have it in a rather formalized a format. Um, it contains, I have it on my desk always because I need it for the coachings every day. <laughs> um, it has like eight buckets here. Can you see it? It's, it's also like in the book. It's spider wheel graphic. <laughs> it's also in the book. It's a spider wheel graphic in the end. Um, and it is coming with a lot of framing questions. Um, for example, okay. Does the product manager understand how she could run great user interviews? 
So that gives you a, that's kind of a yes, no, or somehow answer. And you need to think about 70 of these questions. And if you answer all of those, that gives you a pretty solid idea of what are things you could get better at, what are things that you could learn next. Um, and that's why I created it for. And obviously, I encourage heads of product and product leads to create something similar. So I don't encourage them to use mine um, just like as a copycat. I really encourage them to maybe use mine to overcome, overcome the fear of the white paper, uh, but then really create their own. Because I really think product people are only good in their company context industry. So it needs a bit of tweaking before you're actually applying your product wheel to your um, product folks. But if there is nothing like this, um, then you could start with mine, of course, and then tweak yours um, over time. Um, it's free. It's available for download on my website, um, strongproductpeople.com in that case. And then there's the PM wheel. Um, just have a look. And it really helps. Even if your product lead, for example, doesn't take care of your people development that much, um, as a product manager, you still could use it um, to do a self-assessment. Maybe get some uh, feedback from your developers or an agile coach you're having around and close to you. Um, yeah, so that's why I developed it, and that's what you could use it for. Yeah, um, knowing the the PM wheel, um, there there's um, it's not that much detail on soft skills, but there's a question uh, from the audience on that. So, what are the most important human skills PMs need, in your opinion? Human skills, yeah. So what I ah, oh, so many. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. What I use, so I, I usually. So talk empathy, about, we talked about already, right? We talked about empathy already, right? And then, then there are personality traits that I usually talk about. So one personality trait I always look for is curiosity. Um, then I think empathy slash emotional intelligence is something. And when I talk about this, I always highlight that empathy is the ability to figure out how another person feels, and it does not necessarily mean that you react on it, right? So you don't have always to feel the pain of the whole planet all the time and react on all of these struggles. Um, it still can be that you consciously decide to which of the things you sense are wrong you're going to react. So, right, that there's a, that's a big uh, important thing to know about that. Um, then it's, I think, adaptability is something that is important for product people. Our environment's changing so often. We're learning constantly. We had a brilliant idea, then we put it into a user test and learned it was not a brilliant idea. Um, so all these things, new technologies coming up uh, that requires a lot of um, adaptability. Then I really think it's key that a product manager um, wants to make an impact because that's actually, that's why you're actually shipping things because we all could keep ourselves busy with a lot of discovery, that's fun. Um, but we want to have an impact on the world and the products we're shipping should help people to get a job done um, or to entertain them or whatever you're up for, or whatever your company is up for, right? So that is that is important. And then we and if we look into more of the soft skill things, um, I really think it's key that you're good in communication skills. Um, radical candor is a big topic, giving feedback to each other, um, working with teams to understand how is a team different from a person-to-person -person work relationship. Um, yeah, that, that I think are the key um, elements to that. Yeah, yeah, I fully understand. I, I hope Lisa, your question got answered. Uh, if not, <laughs> join the. <laughs> if not, Lisa. join the. Uh, join the after show and uh, humor. you can discuss Lisa there. this question I may want to add humor to my list <laughs> I think it's not the Lisa you had in mind right now okay <laughs> then still humor is a great uh, thing to have on this list anyway um yeah now 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 talking about a bit the the self-assessment i can imagine mm -hmm. it's sometimes hard to calibrate yourself um as as there might be clear reference metrics missing um so am i really good enough at finding solutions or do i only think i'm good enough as yeah be, be, because i've never seen it done any better um any advice on how i could improve my inner compass how i could could level my inner compass? Attend um, community meetups like this one, for example. Um, 
I really think it's key to spend some time with product folks outside of your company. Um, hear what they are saying, hear what they take care about currently, what are the things. So a great question is, what are you here to learn or what are you currently learning? So this is really, if that's the small talk question number one, I'd say if you attend the product tank um, and one day, hopefully we will all be doing this in person again, which makes it easier. Um, but that is that is super interesting to hear what people worry about and what they currently want to learn. And that helps you to calibrate. So um, if you're working in a pretty large organization, that should help calibrate as well, right? Because then you can spend time in your community of practice or however you call it, a tribe chapter. Um, yeah, but I think spending time with uh, product people outside of the company helps a bit or maybe there are freelance people around that see more than one company a year um, that sometimes are great colleagues to have this conversation as well or um, agile coaches however you're calling them in your organization uh, sometimes take care of more than one team so they at least see another product person in action uh, and you can get some input from them so basically what you're saying is what what we, we'd say to to every product manager with different challenges get more data right so it's uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it's all about getting more data points and a bigger organization it's probably easier because you have more colleagues you you can use as data points and you can use to get feedback or you can simply use to 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 see what they are doing and and uh, yeah copycat or be inspired yeah yeah, but it's not only the data. It's a bit like as always in life, right? So you grow if you expose yourself to the world. And if you're just hiding in your little team over there in your company, then you're not exposing yourself to the world. So go expose yourself to the world. Um, I think that is yeah helpful in all situations where you actually want to learn something new. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Jotty got the next question um, in the YouTube chat. And she asks, could you suggest ways to assess your product gefühl or product sense? Um, as for example, Intercom would put it. Um, how good is it? And what can be done to improve upon it? So how to assess it and how to improve it? Any Any idea? Is it just experience or is it more? Or is it, can I do it without experience? Um, the thing is, I don't perfectly picture what Sean's answer was to that. Um, <laughs> so that would be one thing. He, he, he actually, he did interviews with several product managers to see um, what is the difference between the ones that are having it and the ones that don't. Um, so I cannot answer this precisely. I would need to look into my notes that I actually created for that uh, for that type, uh, kind of talk. But uh, what I would say is, it depends what what, what type of personality you are. So um, if you like, if you're more like an analytical person, then it's a bit of okay, look how others are doing it and deconstruct this and, and look if there are patterns, how they're doing it. And you can do this by either observe what they do, if that's possible, if there are product people around you that you can observe how they're working. Or if not, you can look at other products companies are releasing and creating and just like think about, okay, why they're doing. Or um, another thing that I do um, is you could, so you could use the PM wheel to find real gaps. So that's hard skill gaps let's say coming up with great hypotheses is a thing that you want to learn a bit more. Then there's so many chances these days, for example, expose yourself to podcasts with people that are not uh, having the exact same opinions than you have. And then just see like, okay, but what are the hypotheses and how does their world look like so that they come to the conclusions they come to? So that helps you a lot with this empathy thing and deconstruct things and systems and all these uh, all these kind of things. So yeah, mm -hmm. so that's 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 um, the various ways. Just figure out first what you want to learn, and then really think about okay, how can I train it, um, and how can I can I applying things. Um, is key as well. So you don't build a product gefühl with no engineers around where you can never ever mm. get something done and shipped because that's not how you build your product gefühl. So you really need to learn something, then you need to make sure that you apply it, and then you need to make sure that you actually see how the thing that you have created is be respected by your colleagues or your customers and clients and see if it has an impact you were hoping for. 
So this, do you need this feedback loop? Yeah, completely, completely makes sense. Uh, Svenja asks a bit out of the box, but uh, you're talking about a lot about learning. So what are you currently learning, Petra? Publishing a book and uh, marketing um, for a book and promotion yeah. and managing yeah, time, these, or is it something all else? All these kind of things. <laughs> it, yeah, all these kind of things. Um, this week I was... Um, transferring a lot of mural boards into Miro because I decided <laughs> to use both tools now. So that keeps me busy this week. And it really sucks because these two tools are so close and so different. Um, but now I have, I have them both and I like them both. Um, yeah, so that's things that I'm learning. And with each and every client, I learn something new. Um, and always try to bring it back to the to the system that I already have. So I'm constantly challenging if the things that I already do and teach um, still are connected uh, with the things that I'm learning. And then I just recently agreed on a small um, lecture over summer for students, which is, again, a totally different game. I did it years back, but not with my latest experience. Um, so that is something that I want to learn again um, there's a great book, Small Teaching, that helps me to dive mm. a bit into this, okay, how I didactically help people to digest better what I actually want um, them to learn. So that's the things that I'm currently learning. <laughs> yeah, and Hannah, Hannah wants to take a look uh, back in your personal timeline. So what was ah, the biggest mm -hmm. milestone you had to overcome in your time as a product manager? Product-wise or personal? I think that's up to you what kind of answer you want to give. Maybe you so, you you can remember one one specific key learning you made when you you've been yeah, a so hands on one, product manager. One of the key, yeah, so one of the moments or one of the key learnings I had was um back at my day back in my days at Zing um where at one point a new, I don't know what his title was back at the time, product lead, head of product, CPO, I don't know, whatever, um, joined. And he collected all the things that currently were going on in all the teams. We already have been a, a team of 20 product people, I'd say. Um, and he, we were compiling a massive Excel spreadsheet of all the things that were currently on the backlogs, in the backlogs, uh, planned for the next quarter, and still somewhere uh, at the lower end of the backlog. Um, and then he, he collected all of them. It was a massive effort. Everybody was like worried about, okay, who, why do we need to do all this? And does it, uh, will it really make help? And what he, uh, would really, really help us. And what he actually did in the end was say like, okay, look at the first two things. That's the ones we focus on. And the other 368, we're not talking about them anymore. Forget about and them. <laughs> it was such a crazy thing. Some departments hated it. Um, but for us in product, it was a massive relief. And we actually got shit done the next three months. Um, so that was one of my, okay, if you're laser focused, you really can get things done um, moment, just to name one of the, the moments where actually that helped me to learn a lot. So that was your first radical focus kind of, kind of moment. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there are other ones about working with the team and working remote and all these kind of things. And yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay, let's let's move on. Let's uh, dive into the second block for our Ask Me Anything, because we've now assessed a bit ourselves and learned a bit about uh, our strengths and learning fields and how to assess those. Um, let's dive a bit deeper into personal development. So how do I become a strong product manager? What can I personally do to improve? Um, everybody in the audience, please raise your questions for this block in the chat now using hashtag B as a prefix so we can kind of identify your questions uh, to the second block becoming uh, easily. And in the meantime, maybe Petra can give us a quick introduction here. So Petra, in chapter six of your book, you write about identifying and closing product manager gaps. Um, people managers should ask themselves, or you ask uh, them to ask themselves, uh, whether their PMs can describe their now, next, and long-term vision. Now, without a head of product, uh, what can somebody in the audience, a product manager, do to figure that out themselves? Um, okay, so the first step you always need to do is to figure out what their gap is, right? So, but that's what we have been talking about. 
you make you make such an assessment, whatever tool you're using, there are other ones out there. PM wheel is just one of them. Um, and then you have this, let's say, prioritization. You figured out, okay, prioritization is maybe not my strong stake. So now how to become better in prioritization? And what I usually say, like, you need to come up with a contract with yourself. Um, so you need to sit down and write down um, what you actually want to improve. And um, there's a super simple framework I use for this. I tell the people, describe your as is. So what is the annoying part of not being great in prioritization? For example, you constantly need to argue about um, your wh why you have put things in disorder, right? Everybody is questioning your prioritization. You're prioritizing, mm -hmm. but people are still questioning why they do, um, why you have been doing it that way. And then I encourage people to describe your to be. So how would it feel? And it's important that I say feel really. So what is the relief moment? So how would it feel if all of these neg negatively connotated things that you described in the as is will be all gone? And how could, and that's another important question, how could people tell that Petra has improved on prioritization? So what would change um, that they, re so less arguments with them, for example. So lesser people arrive at your desk and asking like, Okay, but why is this the prioritization of your backlog? Um, and then you think about, okay, and what do I need to do to go from A to B, from my, as it currently is, description to my to be description, and that's the actions. Um, so then you just describe four or five or six actions, not 20, please. Um, so things that you actually can do to get closer to your to be description. Um, and for example, if we stay with this prioritization example, then first of all, you could reflect on how am I currently prioritizing? Are there any deliberately chosen criteria how I do it? Is it my gut feeling? Um, and then you could think about, okay, and how could I explain my way of prioritization to other people so that they maybe not have to ask all the time? Mm. Um, and then you maybe figure out, okay, maybe I need to work a bit on my storytelling around that. So that could be an action item on there. Um, and you want to define a time frame for, because I said it's a contract with yourself. So you say like, okay, this contract um, of me taking these actions is valid until, um, and the timing I usually tend to use here is three to four months, um, because that's a great time to, because you're busy, you're product people. I know <laughs> you cannot work on personal development all the time. So, but if it's 20 minutes a week, that's already an, a good start and you can take it from there. And if you see it brings you a lot and it makes you a, a better, more efficient product person, it's easier to invest a bit more time. Um, but that's what you want to aim for. So first of all, start with 20 minutes a week dedicated to your um, self-development, create this future self or fill in the future self framework of as is description, to be description and some actions and try to work on it for a decent amount of time. Um, talking about those tricks to, to develop, um, let, let's say, do you have any like trainings, courses, any recommendations? What, 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 what advice would you give when somebody asks for what, what training should I go to? How, how can I find the, the best training for my personal development? Trainings. Only a good idea if you want to acquire new know-how because um, that's what you actually want um, a training to do. So you need to learn something new, a uh, new legal yeah, legislation things, then you go, go to a training, somebody tells you that's the new rules, um, that's the new laws, and then you actually know the thing, right? Yeah. Training over. Um, for anything else than acquiring new know-how, you need to combine several things. So a training could be a good start, um, but then you need to think about, okay, how can I apply what I've actually learned in the training, because if you don't, then the training budget is just wasted. Um, so please only book trainings if you can make more time in your calendar and really make use of what you have learned. Um, that's what something you should be planned for. And if product leaders are listening in, please make sure your people block some time if they attend a training um, to really work with this. Um, and so that is one part that's the learning and then there is the application of it and what leads to true mastery is the piece with um 
helping others to understand what you learned or teaching others. And that could be easily done. You have a training, you apply it, and then you give a talk in your company at an all-hands meeting and just like explain what you learned and how it worked when you applied it. Maybe the methodology sucked and that is a learning as well. Um, or maybe you had really great results to share um, with your colleagues. And even if it's just like uh, onboarding a new colleague that has recently joined, that massively helps to anchor the things you have learned. So that would be my tip. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a lot of the stuff is for free. So it not always has to be the super expensive training. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of talks out there for example, on mindtheproduct.com, um, there's there's a lot of uh, resources, and we, we'll even show you more resources at the end of uh, ah, uh, this and talk today. Maybe you can find a learning buddy that is super helpful as well. So if somebody else from your company is up for the same topic, then go watch a talk together and then discuss it for 20 minutes. Way nicer than just watching the talk alone. Yeah. Yeah, ni nice idea. I love that. Um, Marike is asking a question. How can we as a product manager quantify everything that we are doing? That that sounds like, like a big plan. Everything that we are doing, we want to quantify um, to, to understand all the great results that we are bringing and especially to see our personal growth. So that goes a bit towards the direction, understanding your, yourself as a product um, and how do I now measure, uh, how do I get the data um, to really understand the product's performance, which means my personal development performance. Yeah, this is hard. So, so first of all, it always should be, so if you are happy with your personal progression, then I think this is the major KPI, right? Um, because ideally you want to learn, constantly want to learn something to become a competent first and maybe even better product manager or in the future. Um, because that's, that's, That's something you take with you wherever you go. So whatever you learn in your current job and in your current company, and even maybe if the surrounding is not ideal, you still will learn something. So always, always reflect on what is my current, the current topic that I'm looking into and what am I currently learning. Sometimes it's just like managing upwards because that's what is currently necessary in your environment. And um, that is fine. So first and, uh, first and for all, you are the measure of your personal um, success and progress. And if you're happy, I think that uh, should be already a nice uh, measurement. Then if you have a capable product lead around, um, she hopefully would actually talk to you and discuss what she sees, where there are gaps, and could help you to reveal some of the, um, there is a Rumsfeld scale, and they call it the unknown unknowns on that scale. Mm -hmm. So everybody has this, things that they should know but they don't know that they should know these things and that's where you need colleagues peers or a capable line manager that helps you to see these things and says like um for example i once had a weird or not weird but i had a one-on-one -on -one coaching session with marty kagan and he pointed out to me that he thinks my product evangelizing skills were non-existable <laughs> and he was right because my I, my storytelling was not existing um, especially not in an American scale of storytelling, even not on a German scale. Um, and it really helped me in my product career that he pointed out, hey, Petra, I think you really need to learn how to tell better stories um, and how to yeah, rally the whole team behind what you actually want to achieve and the product you want to create and really make them feel the user pain. And you do it with using natural language and telling a story. So please go learn this. Um, and he sent me off with some book recommendations how a great coach would actually do it so or how a great leader would do it, not leaving the person alone with the information of your product evangelizing skill sucks. Have a nice day. Um, so really help the people to understand that. So a capable boss would help you um, yeah, with this measurement as well, hopefully. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that Marty Kagan story. Although you now <laughs> stole me my question to introduce oh, you to the third uh, plug. <laughs> so uh, let's see what I'm going <laughs> to ask you then. Um, but yeah, I, I heard that story because I was listening to all the podcasts you've been in. Um, 
I think over the course of the last month, uh, we've, we've seen you talking in many podcasts. And in the Project A podcast, for example, you said that product managers should understand providing clarity as kind of their own product and distribute this product throughout the company. Could you please elaborate a bit on, on how this makes me a strong product manager? I actually started to say this as um, a counter metaphor for this. A product manager has to make every decision. So decision taking is the thing that a product manager is responsible for um, because I don't agree. I think you're responsible for making sure that decisions get made by whoever um, and to equip people with a lot of information so that they are able to um, come up with great decisions or with the right decision or with timely decisions. Um, I think clarity is an important thing. So really make sure that everybody understands what we're currently up for. Um, and if this is something you can provide as a product person, your job gets way easier and aligning people and rallying the team behind you gets way easier as well. So that's why I think clarity is a really important thing um, to create if you are a product manager. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's maybe wrap up uh, the blog Becoming a Strong Product Manager with one last question from Gregory. Um, and Gregory gives you the chance to to tidy up with an evergreen, let's say. Um, mm. And he asks, do you think PMs need to know how to code? No. Um, Short answer, <laughs> no. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, I think they should be interested in how these things work. And I think if a product manager has never ever written code, not even in a training or something like this, that's maybe not cool. Because when you start coding and if you do a bit of coding, you understand why it's not cool to interrupt your team all the time and to ask the developer um, a question now and then in 15 minutes and then another one in 20 minutes. Because you really have these experiments, but oh, I need to concentrate. Can you please back off? Um, so I think it helps you to um, sympathize with your team and empathize with them. And it for sure helps you to prototype things if you are in a rather small company. Now these days with no code, I know there are easy, easier ways to do this, but still the, all of this is pretty technical. Um, so for sure, you should be interested in technology. Um, at least when you're responsible for a digital product, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you, if it's a washing machine, then maybe you should be interested in washing a lot. But, um, <laughs> you get, you, so you get the idea. You, sh you should have a decent interest in, in technology. But I see great product people coming out of with no code, code, ex no code experience, uh, with no coding experience, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So we discussed A, assessing and B, becoming. It's time to dive a bit deeper into C, challenging. Um, so challenging environments as a product manager. Some organizational environments might be especially challenging for product managers, while you as a product manager might also have some power or influence uh, to challenge uh, and change these environments, actually. Um, so everybody out there, please raise your questions for our last block in the chat now. Please start them with hashtag C. And to kick off that block, Petra, I'd like to ask you um, the, the following question. Um, one, one, let's say one, one, um, uh, one, one point, one entity in, in that environment, maybe the closest entity for me as a product manager is for sure my people manager. Um, and your people manager, for those who read the book already, should for sure support you, challenge you and coach you. Um, but any advice on what PMs could do when they lack these kinds of people managers? So any advice? Should they hire an external coach like you, or what, what should what should they do? What what could they do to up in their game? So many answers to this. Um, so, <laughs> so first of all, I would always look for what is available for free. So, is there somebody close to me? where I could actually learn from? Is there a senior product manager around, or even if it's just like somebody else doing pro a product with me um you could you could learn a lot from an interaction designer or your product marketing 
um, colleague over there. So um, these are the things where you could actually go uh, and learn a lot. And these days, more and more companies don't even have people managers because it's a lot of peer feedback and peer reviewing. Um, and then the question is, what can I offer, right? So if you get great in giving feedback to people, then it's way easier to find other ones that are giving feedback to you and happy to do this. Um, so first of all, go find somebody else in your company who could be your mentor and really helps you to reveal this unknown unknowns because that's what you're actually searching for. And that that does not necessarily have to be a product management person because maybe you're not that good in creating business cases, but there for sure is somebody who knows uh, how these things work in your company. Hopefully, otherwise, go run. Um, so that is that is something I would I would suggest doing. Start really with the people that are um, close to you, easy um, to access and easy to reach. Then there are so many product Slack communities out there. You could ask there, hey, is somebody interested in learning this um, this and that and join me on this journey? So that would be something you could be doing. Um, and if there is a line manager, and that often is good, okay, there often is a line manager, they just don't invest enough time into people development. Um, then my question always is, is there because they can't? Um, which means like, are they lacking a definition of what a great product person looks like? Yeah, then it might be nice to get yourself a product. <laughs> yeah, buy this book or <laughs> maybe a product coach um, that helps the two of you to identify the gaps and then again is out of the picture and you can work on it uh, mm -hmm. over a longer period of time. Um, so get, that could be an option. Uh, some people really like to get a mentor. So I sometimes see this on Twitter where people start to often be in the same discussions and then at some meetup or conference, you see that they are actually now in super close relationship and um, exchanging tips and tricks and um, these kind of things. So mentoring um, is a nice thing to do. Um, that's something I um, tend to tell people if they want to become a product leader sometime maybe you can just mentor somebody else from another company um, and see if you can actually do this people development thing um, in this coaching thing and learn to how to explain concepts to other people. It's a bit of teaching and you need to get into that. So that is something you could be doing. Yeah. But can you also make line managers care about um, people, people development and, and how can you do that? <laughs> That's something Jennifer asked. So any advice besides throwing your book at him or her? <laughs> yeah, usually that's actually a thing. Um, if they're not interested in that, it doesn't help to buy the book for them and just put it on their desk because <laughs> they won't trade it, right? Um, yeah, the thing is, how can you make them care? That's, that is the question. And uh, for that, you need to understand how your particular line manager currently works. What is motivating him? So um, if um, they're having family, for example, I I'm sure they don't want to work over hours. So whatever saves them time um, could actually help them. So maybe uh, talk to them and sh say like, hey, can we please spend a bit of your time on my people development to make me more efficient, to save you a lot uh, more time down the line, right? So that could be something interesting. And then other people uh, or line manager might be um, interested in, they're in constantly hiring. Is your line manager constantly hiring product people because people are quitting and leaving the company and they bring in new ones? Um, so that is actually, and that's in the book somewhere, I don't recall the original source, but it's, 65,000 US dollar in average to replace an employee. This is super crazy. Tell them that if they love numbers, tell them that they should invest in you. 65,000 euro they can invest in you and you stay. How nice is that? Um, so these there, there are some arguments, but you as always have to think about, okay, how, what makes them tick? So what makes my line manager tick? Um, is it more that they want to save time or what do they want to save money for the company? Or it's maybe both. Um, or maybe you can uh, explain them why it is um, helpful for their further career if they get into a coaching mm -hmm. habit. Because now we're talking. Nowadays, coaching is an important skill to have for somebody leading um, other people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're saying basically you, sh you should convince your people manager by telling him about him or her uh, about the outcome of this coaching activity. Their reward. And, that's the yeah. important thing. Yeah. What's their reward? Outcome-driven discussions. Managing um, 
Um, Rafaela is asking a question um, related to the COVID situation. So how is COVID impacting the job of a product manager or a product leader from your point of view? Could you please share some personal experiences? What do you ob observe with the customer you, uh, customers you're working with, for example? That is so diverse depending on the industry they're in. Um, because some of my customers massively benefit from the situations because um, they are in industries that are actually going through the roof in this pandemic. Um, and other ones really struggle because they really um, yeah, have had some negative impact from all of what is currently happening. But do you think it's so, a good time for personal development or do you think it's it's really sure, a burden for personal for development? Person. No. And the job market is... I think it still depends on where on this globe you are, but at least in Europe, I see so many companies hiring and I see so many um, people uh, searching for a job um, way more than um, more than one year ago. I would say one year ago, but it's actually now more than one year ago. Um, it's not that static. Uh, everybody is up for more experimentation currently. So only being... Um, remote was something that was super weird uh, 14 months ago, uh, despite for some companies, I know. Um, but now everybody is just like, ah, yeah, okay, he's still in Australia. I don't mind. Let's go higher and onboard him. And then let's see, maybe he can relocate someone later. And if not, um, so I think that has um, dramatically changed um, for, for all the companies I currently am working with. Um, yeah, but that's main, and, and it really depends if you have been hit by this pandemic or actually if you are flourishing because of it. But do you see that your coaches are maybe more left alone now that they lack these formats like meeting other people at the uh, at the coffee machine in the office or having some informal exchange in the evening because they maybe don't know about great formats like the product tank where, where they could meet up and uh, meet like-minded people? Do you see that that became tougher or is it the other way no, around or is it, it does it doesn't it matter at all the thing is the sample i see is a pretty biased sample because that's people that are dedicating time to people development right and i don't see the ones that don't so that's why i'm maybe not the right person to answer these questions the ones that i have in coaching for a decent amount of time um tend to have a bit more time in the pandemic for people development because it's maybe everybody has this okay the world is changing i need to keep up um so that's maybe why uh, companies allow a bit more time for digesting and see what's happening and maybe learn a new skill but that's maybe a question i i'm not the perfect person to ask because the, the, the yeah the slice i see is uh, so into people development that's a weird sample yeah, and Andreas is asking um, a question uh, regarding stakeholder management. So we're talking about challenging environments, and we know in a, in, in, in a lot of companies, the stakeholder landscape is quite complex, and, um, and you sometimes also have stakeholders um, who are not that easy to connect to. Um, so what's your advice um, on how to become better in aligning the stakeholders as product owner? map them <laughs> so it's a bit like with my um, advice on how to handle your line manager um, first of all figure out why they are stakeholders to what you're actually doing why they're interested in that um, and what's in for them so that is always my question okay what is in for them um, and why are they so interested in what I'm currently doing um, and then you really need to build a relationship. That's the other thing, right? So you want to learn more about their struggles and their pains and the gains you could bring them as much as you maybe want to do it with your um, with your customers and your user. It depends on the setup for sure. Um, but that is an important question I always ask first is, what can I do for you? Or And, and it's a bit like with user research and then the five whys. So why is that something... Um, you're interested in um, 
And if you're working in an environment where shared goals uh, and OKRs frameworks are already in use, then it's easier because then usually you're sharing some goals. Um, then the alignment isn't that hard. Then things are often pretty obvious. Um, what are the next best uh, things you could be doing? If that is not the case, then you have to find other ways to find this common ground. So what are the, the and there is always common ground. So even if it's the smallest things, um, then first of all, acknowledge the things you, you both, you and your stakeholder want to actually bring forward and then take it from there. Um, so I think that's an important thing. Um, let's Plus maybe for management for ages, by the way. <laughs> let, let, let's maybe at the end um, talk about the positive side of things. And one of the partners in Grime in, in every organization is hopefully your UX designer. Um, and M point S point is asking, um, how would Petra describe the ideal relationship between a product manager and UX design? How does it look like? What, what would you say? Love. <laughs> love. <laughs> um, <laughs> How would that love manifest in the daily business? What is the ideal relationship? A close working relationship? Um, uh, it's, it's really hard to answer the question because I, so what I assume is um, that you're working on the same thing, right? So that's why, why they, you are validating the same hypotheses. So you constantly are in this, okay, where are we? What do we currently want to figure out? By the way, there should always be somebody from engineering joining you on this if you're creating digital products. Um, and then you three, hopefully, um, should always be in the same, same working mode of, okay, where are we? What do we need to learn next to actually achieve this goal we're having and um, something that you want to have as an outcome for your customers and for your clients, right? So this is the actual thing that you want um, to do in a close collaboration with your designer and your engineer. And it should be and again, it's clear if your role is yeah in sync and yeah. your role is to bring the clarity to this situation. So what are we up for? Why are we up for that? Um, and what do we need to learn next? And how are we actually, uh, how do we want to learn this? Because it's not always that you need to Uh, throw a usability test at people. Sometimes it's just like you need to um, get the tech people down to work and code something that you can then see if the technology is ready, for example. That's another type of an experiment you could run. Mm -hmm. For um, to, 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 to close the Ask Me Anything session, um, maybe let's, let's try to widen the horizon a bit and um, try to take the whole company ecosystem into account. Um, in part five of Strong, um, you're writing about the right environment and how to build a great culture. Um, from your point of view, what are the key ingredients of a great culture, a culture where product management can really thrive or product um, thinking? I think it's a lot, three things. Um, just, just the things that are coming to the top of my, of my mind. So it's not, maybe not an elaborate list, but alignment and clarity as set and shared goals is for sure a super important thing. So if your company does value the clarity that you could bring to the company or if everybody, somebody else, so many people in the company can bring more clarity to what you currently do. I think this is super helpful and meaningful. Um, that is something. And then um, acknowledging the fact that all of this is a team sport these days and that none of us is a rock and we cannot, we cannot, um, succeed on our own. So it's always a team sport and you need a a diverse team of people with diverse backgrounds and diverse professions. Um, and everybody needs to have a say or at least a voice um, in whatever you do. Um, so this is uh, an, another important thing you want to look for. And then um, learning in all sorts of forms and not only the personal development part, but as I said, like discovery and all the things we're usually talking about, this is learning. This is like I have an hypothesis, now let's go see if it stands the test of user research or things like this, right? So, and that, that is up to a higher scale. So if the company is still on this, yeah, but our CEO exactly knows what we need to do, 
um, that's maybe not an ideal um, environment for stellar product management, right? Yeah, that's the hippo environment, which which probably is not not the best to uh, to no. live in. Because then so, the company would be only as clever as the CEO. Yeah, think about true. it. That's good. <laughs> Petra, thank you so much. Um, we, that we was could fun. It was a pleasure. Great questions, people. I, I hope so. Um, we we could continue this for hours because it's always a pleasure talking to you and and learning from your experience. So thank you very much for being with us tonight, and thanks for sharing your thoughts on product management. Thanks for um, having also, me. Also, I want to thank you once again for writing strong. Mm -hmm. We've we've heard about the pain uh, you you had to deal with uh, during the pandemic. So. Thanks very much for putting the effort into this book. I truly believe um, it's a big contribution to the product community. And if only a few or better, all of the heads of product out there uh, would apply your methods, I'm sure it will become a better world for product managers in the end. So thank you very much, Petra. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the questions. <laughs> um, for those of you listening to us who already read the book Strong and are keen to learn more, Petra curated over 170 articles, podcasts, books, and more on Beyond. Um, that's a new project co-founded by our Product Tank organizer, Alex, who you see on the screen here as well. Um, and you just need to scan this QR code right now uh, to find the collection. And then you get 170 articles, podcasts, books, and much more on Beyond. So scan it now, take a screenshot, whatever you need to do. But don't get lost there because we want you to join the after show event um, as well. So for those of you who've not read the book or even worse, don't have a copy yet, join our amazing quiz show just now. Just now. So we'll have an interactive quiz show. And for this, let me please dress up in MTP Cyan. Um, our amazing show masters, Anya and Arno, um, will be waiting in wonder.me for you. Uh, Anya is going to share the link uh, to the Wonder Space just now. So you can click there and join wonder.me. And there you'll get the chance to socialize, to meet Petra again, to talk to her in person, which means via video these days. And just follow the link that's been shared in the chat right now. We will see you there in a few minutes. Give us a few moments to arrive and we'll give you a few moments to arrive as well and then we're gonna start the legendary quiz show of product tank hamburg um petra i've seen on instagram earlier today that you uh you've you've been very well prepared for tonight's after show event and you even got your dancing shoes on uh, could you please do us a last favor and show these legendary shoes? Wow, that's cool. that's my that's my stage <laughs> shoes tonight, because even if it's a virtual event, I wanted to dress up a bit. Otherwise, it's too boring. So that's why I brought my stage shoes tonight. <laughs> I think it was it was worth it. So thanks yeah. again, Petra. <laughs> thanks for everybody listening to us. Um, thanks to the backstage team, Anya, Alex, Arne, for cur curating the questions and operating the show. Um, we'll see you all on wonder.me. Click the link now. Don't forget to join and have fun. Good night. See Thank you there. You. <laughs>